the thesis of the book is that there has been a massive invasion of global warming policy into our government uh, and into our lives. And I'll give you an example of some of this from a potential point of view. Uh, on June 26, 2009, uh, the Waxman-Markey bill passed the House of Representatives. It squeaked by by three votes. And it would reduce emissions 3 percent below 2005 levels by 2012, 16 by 2020, 42 by 2030, and 83 by 2050. Now, this seems benign, I guess, until you realize what this means to your life. These are U.S. per capita carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, and uh, over here uh, is year. This is where it was in 2005. We've had a decline in per capita emissions in part uh, in recent years because of the discovery of shale gas. Uh, and by the year 2050, you will be allowed the per capita emissions of the average American in 1867. Now, that will require some intrusion in your life. Uh, what will it do? This is the amount of warming. This is using the United Nations uh, 2.5 degree sensitivity model for doubled carbon dioxide. We could debate about this a lot, but that would be a different subject. Uh, if every nation of the world does what it's doing now and continues on the emissions pathways that they are on, uh, the planet would warm 1.58 degrees between 1990 and 2050. If Waxman-Markey were, in, were in, in the U.S. at 2050 levels, beginning immediately, uh, the amount of warming would be 1.54 degrees, or four hundredths of a degree would be saved. Now, if all the nations that had obligations under the Kyoto Protocol immediately fulfilled the 83 percent reduction of Waxman-Markey, the amount of warming that would be prevented by 2050 is a grand total of eight hundredths of a degree C. It's, it's an amount that's too small to measure. So you has, have to ask yourself, why is there such large involvement of this process in our lives? especially when we are so profoundly irrelevant. Here, is, uh, the, here are the carbon dioxide emissions per year in me million metric tons. Uh, and we are blue. This is the United States. In 2006, the United, China passed the United States in emissions. Ours are actually going down. That's for two reasons. One, our economy is going down. Two, shale gas is displacing coal. Uh, for electrical generation, shale gas, uh, natural gas produces, depending upon how you cut it, maybe about 70 percent of the carbon dioxide emissions of coal per unit energy. <clears throat> and in China, coal is going up dramatically. Right now, as we speak, China's emissions are 42 percent greater per year than are ours. So if we cut our emissions by 40 percent, China would make that up immediately. It's not a very pretty picture. Now, what happened when this was passed, by the way, the Waxman-Markey bill, it passed on June 26, 2009. Any of you look at Rasmussen's presidential tracking approval index? It's the strongly agree with what he's doing versus strongly disagree. When it's negative, that's bad. The index is a three-day moving average. And on June 29th, the first day that he could have three days of Waxman-Markey data in it, his index went from positive to negative, And it has never been positive one day since. Now, I assure you that the Senate staffers look at that every morning. And they probably went to the boss on Monday morning, the 29th, and said, uh, <clears throat> the President's approval rating just went negative. I suggest you act like you're going to pass cap and trade and then somehow kind of find an excuse to not do it. And that's precisely what happened. And so what has happened is it has gone from Congress to the Environmental Protection Agency. And that gets us closer to the subject matter in this book. You see, the Supreme Court ordered the EPA in mass v. EPA to determine whether or not carbon dioxide was a, quote, pollutant, meaning something that harms health and welfare, human health and welfare. And if it did, it must therefore regulate it to the point that it no longer harms human health and welfare. Well, this question got before the Bush administration, and they said, well, we're not going to make a report on this, or we don't think we have the information for this. Well, I assure you the Obama administration did, 
uh, and they found an endangerment, as they say. The key phrase in the endangerment, most of the observed increase in global average temperatures since the mid-20th century is very likely due to the observed increase in anthropogenic greenhouse gas concentrations. And herein lies some of the subject matter of this book. This was based largely upon a document called the Report of the U.S. Global Change Research Program. Uh, I cannot find a paragraph in this report that is not missing something from the scientific literature that would alter dramatically the conclusion that was made on the basis of that paragraph. And right now I've undertaken a Cato project to produce that report, something that will look exactly like it, paragraph for paragraph, with what was missing. It's a lot of fun and it's really easy. Anyway, <clears throat> why does this happen? Well, science is a publicly funded entity. Public science is public choice. If you want to see how public choice is intruding upon science, I offer you the following. Uh, here is uh, Eisenhower's statement in his farewell speech. Everybody knows this statement. Uh, in the councils of government, we guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power will persist. Few people read the next paragraph, operative part, holding scientific research and discovery in respect as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become captive of a scientific technological elite, which is where we are today. Now, examples of public choice science, anybody recognize this building? This is the head of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It's on New York Avenue, not very far from here. Do you think it's here because they like hot summers? No. <laughs> It's here because they are the lobby for scientists, and what lobbyists do is they get money. And the way to get money is to at least show some support for your pet programs. So three summers ago, I, I could not get the ex exact banner, but this is very close. Hanging from the 12th Street side of the American Association for the Advancement of Science was the following banner. Now, we're not mixing our science with our politics or anything like that. Uh, anyway, it started a long time ago. Vannevar Bush was written to by President Roosevelt in 1944. Uh, the, the president recognized the success of the Manhattan Project and proposed that the Manhattan Project be institutionalized. Um, we are going to apply the existing scientific research to the solution of technological problems paramount in war. However, there is no reason why these lessons to be found in this experiment cannot be profitably employed in times of peace. The information techniques and research experience developed by the Office of Strategic Scientific Research and Development, which oversaw the Manhattan Project, should be used in the days of peace ahead for the creation of new enterprises, bringing new jobs, and the betterment of the national standard of living. Hmm. Sounds like green jobs to me. And as a result of this, we will create a fuller and more fruitful employment and a fuller and more fruitful life. What goes around comes around. Well, as a result, the National Science Foundation was founded. And then when the various agencies decided that they did not have enough programmatic science within the National Science Foundation, they developed their own science programs. And that is all publicly funded. Nobody gets funding for anything in the scientific world by going in front of Congress and saying, "My." area is not important. So what we have done here is we have created a culture of scientific exaggeration. And for want of a better thing, some people know what this is. This is the State Science Institute from the movie Atlas Shrugged, uh, which judged Reardon Metal to be a dangerous, dangerous thing. So now we have to discuss whether, in fact, this intrusion of global warming into government is A, large, B, if it is large, is that good, or B, should, C, should not be, and if it is not, is that good or bad?